Hi, I'm Ankit and you're watching the Daily News Simplified, which is your one-stop solution to daily current affairs analysis. And in today's DNS, that is 22nd of November, we have picked up seven different articles. The first five articles are from prelims perspective. And we'll start off this discussion with the folk art of India. Because page 4 of the Hindu, it covers a beautiful photograph of a folk art called Kolkali. And it occurs in the state of Kerala, which marks the remembrance of St. Thomas's arrival in India. Whereas the second article, it appeared in the front page of the Hindu and it shows a photograph of one horned rhino, which appeared in the Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam. The third article, it is related to Sathi portal. Because Ministry of Education, it has asked all states to encourage aspirants for competitive exams in order to utilize the Sathi portal for their preparation. The fourth article, it is from the science section of the Hindu and it is related to a photograph of Northern Lights, which is a significant atmospheric phenomena and has also been a popular tourist attraction. The fifth article, it is on a public offering of shares and it is in news because five companies in India they will raise their IPO, which is initial public offering in Indian stock markets. And with this IPO, these five companies, they aim to raise more than 7,000 crores of public funds. Now in the main centric discussion, we will start off with the climate change negotiation as COP28, which is conference of parties and its 28th annual meeting, it will be occurred, it will happen in Dubai. And in this regard, an aspirant, he needs to be clear about what are the principles and issues related to climate change negotiations. Further, in the last article of the day, we will discuss India-Japan relations. And it is in news because of the op-ed in the, the Hindu newspaper. As this op-ed and its author, it highlights that the conditions are prime for these two countries to operationalize their shared vision for Indo-Pacific. But before concluding today's discussion, I will also take your doubts. So please stay tuned till the end of the discussion and ask me any doubt in the comment section right at the end of today's discussion. Hence, let us start our today's discussion with this first article of the day which appeared in the page 4 of the Hindu newspaper. And as you can see in this photograph, it shows the Kolkali, which is a folk art being performed in the state of Kerala. And it is because it this particular art, it marks remembrance of St. Thomas's arrival in India. And this topic, it is important from GS Paper 1 perspective, which highlights Indian culture and it also covers significant aspects of art forms. Further, questions related to folk dance in, folk dance in India it appeared in the prelims of the year 2014. Hence, in similar fashion, we have curated a practice question on folk arts. But before solving this practice question, let us describe or let us discuss what are these particular folk arts. The first folk art, it is known as Maliyattam. And it is quite popular in the state of Kerala as well as Tamil Nadu. Now, this particular art, it is named after a peacock dance. Now, there are other folk arts as well. For example, Kalayattam, which shows a bull dance, whereas Karadiattam, it shows bear dance. On the other hand, Aliattam, it shows demon dance, whereas Pampuattam, it shows snake dance. Now, the second art, the, now the second folk dance in this regard is the Kolkali, which also appeared in the news article. And it is quite prevalent in the state of Kerala. Now this is more than 200 year old tradition. And it shows that these dance, they are done with the sticks. Further, this dance activity, it is performed on a specially constructed wooden stage. And due to this, this art, it is also known as Thattin Melkalu. Further, the third dance in this regard is Burakatha. 
and it is prevalent in the states of Andhra Pradesh as well as Telangana. Now this particular art, it is performed by three individuals, when first is the main or main performer of this dance, whereas other two are the co-performers. And the topic which are related to din dance, it is related to Hindu mythology. Now the fourth particular dance, it is known as Chakyar Kutha. Now this Chakyar Kutha, it is a prevalent art form in the state of Kerala. And it shows combination of both prose as well as poetry. And only a solo performer performs these dance and dresses himself as a snake. Hence, you can see this particular dance, it is performed by a traditionally community which is known as Chakyar and hence the name Chakyar Kuthu. Now, after we have discussed these particular four cards, let us now discuss the model question. Now, this model question, it asks us to relate four cards with associated states. The first four card, Maliattam, it is associated with the state of Kerala and it is true because we have discussed this Maliattam, it is prevalent in Kerala as well as Tamil Nadu. Now, the second four card, it is Kolkali and the question says it is associated with state of Telangana, which obviously is incorrect because this art, it is popular in the state of Kerala. The third art is Burakhata and it is associated with state of Karnataka, which makes this third option incorrect because Burakatha, it is prevalent in Andhra as well as Telangana. Whereas the last folk art with this Chakyar Kutu, it is also prevalent in Kerala and not Andhra Pradesh. Hence, this fourth option is also incorrect. Now, these three options are, are incorrect and first are correct, which makes option A the correct answer. Whereas the PYQ is concerned, option C was the right answer as Mohini Attam, it is not associated with the state of Odisha. Rather, it is associated with state of Kerala. Now with this, let us move to the second article of the day and it appeared in the front page of the Hindu. Now as you can see in this particular article, it shows one horned rhino in the Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary which is located in the state of Assam. Now before solving or before knowing why is this topic important, let us first understand similar questions that have been asked in UPSC prelims exams before. For example, this first question or previous question, it appeared in the prelims exam of 2019 and it asked us about Asiatic land, double humped camel as well as one horned rhinoceros. Hence, this one horned rhinoceros is important from prelims point of view. And also, we have curated this practice question on one horned rhino. But before solving this question, let us know more about what is Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary as well as know more about one horned rhino. Now this Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary, it is located in the state of Assam and it is on the flood plains of Brahmaputra River. Further, this sanctuary, it is famous for one horned rhino as this sanctuary, it has the highest density of one horned rhino in the entire world. Further, this sanctuary, it also has the second highest concentration of one horned rhino after the Kaziranga National Park. Now, there are also other animals which are very much available in this particular wildlife sanctuary. And these are leopard, wild boar, barking deer as well as wild buffaloes. Further, this park, it also has more than 2,000 migratory birds as well as other popular animals. Now, this park, it is a participant of Indian Rhino Vision, which wants to preserve at least 3,000 rhinos in seven protected areas of Assam by the year of 2020. Now, what is one horned rhino? It is a vulnerable species as per the IUCN as well as it is 
mentioned in the appendix one of the sites convention. Further, this one horn rhino, it is also important from Indian cultural perspective. Because one horn rhino, it was present in the Pasupati seal of the Indus Valley civilization. Hence, you can see, besides environmental, the cultural aspect of this particular animal, it is quite significant in the Indian context. And hence, now let us solve the practice question. This practice question, it asks us to consider the following statements with reference to one-horned rhinos. The first statement, Pobitra Wildlife Sanctuary holds the highest number of one-horned rhino in the world, which we know is incorrect because it is Kaziranga National Park and not Pobitra Wildlife Sanctuary which holds the highest number of wild of this one-horned rhino. Rather, Pobitra Wildlife Sanctuary, it holds the highest density and not the number of one-horned rhino. The second statement, it shows that it was unknown, that is one-horned rhino, it was unknown to the Indus Valley civilization, which we know again is incorrect because it was present in the Pasupati seal of the Indus Valley civilization. Further, the third statement, it says that the one horned rhino, it is listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list, which we know is correct. Hence, only one statement is correct, making option A the correct answer. Whereas PYQ is concerned, here also option A was the correct answer. Now with this, let us move to the third article of the day, which appeared in page 12 of the Hindu newspaper. Now in this article, the union government, that is Ministry of Education, it has asked all states to popularize this Sathi portal. Because this Sathi portal, it can be utilized by students to prepare for their competitive exams. Also, this particular portal and the topic of education in general, it is important from GS paper 2 perspective. Because UPSC main syllabus, it highlights issues relating to social sector and services, especially with relations to education as well as human resource. Further, educational portals like Vidyanjali Yojana as well as different governmental schemes for education sector, it has been area of interest of UPSC, which you can see from this PYQ of the year 2017. Hence, on similar lines, we have curated this practice question on this Sathi portal, as this Sathi, it is an abbreviation of self-assessment test and help for entrance exam. Now, before solving this practice question, let us know more about what is this Sathi portal. Now, this Sathi portal, it was developed by Ministry of Education in collaboration with IIT Kanpur. And this portal, it enables students to prepare for JE as well as NEET exams. Further, this portal will also provide education in coming future with respect to NCRT syllabus. Now, how this portal provides education? And it is through a 45-day crash course which is available in both live as well as recorded format. Further, this portal, it utilizes an AI program called Pruter which was developed by IIT Kanpur. Hence, you can see this, this is an AI based tool which helps in J and NEET exam preparation. Further, the study materials on this portal, it is available in four languages that is English, Hindi, Odia as well as Telugu. And efforts have been made to make it available for other languages as well. Further, this portal, it also envisages Sathi Mitras as these Mitras, they will act as friends and will popularize this portal in rural areas, thereby increasing the rural coverage of governmental educational benefits. Now, one of the most astounding features of this portal is that it also provides reports to parents regarding their kids preparation in 11th as well as 12th standards. Hence, now that we have discussed Sathi portal, let us solve this practice question. With reference to self-assessment test and help for entrance exam, that is Sathi portal, consider the following statements. 
the first statement it says that it has been launched by ministry of education and iit kanpur which we know is a correct statement the second statement it says that the interactive program is open for coaching help for public services examination and sorry to say this portal is not available for upsc preparation rather it helps students to prepare for je as well as neat entrance examinations and second statement which you know is incorrect now the third statement it says that this portal it utilizes indigenously developed ai program called sathi mitras now we know that the indigenously ai program it was called as pruter and these sathi mitras they are agents to popularize these particular portal hence third statement is also incorrect now the fourth statement it says that the digital learning material in this portal they are available in languages mentioned in the eighth schedule of constitution now we have seen that this portal it provides educational material in english hindi odia as well as telugu and not all eight schedule languages which makes statement four also incorrect hence from this above discussion we can conclude that option a is the correct answer now the answer to this pyq that is vidyanjali yojana was option a now let us move to the fourth article of the day which appeared in the science and tech section of the hindu newspaper and this shows a beautiful photograph of a phenomena popularly known as northern lights now this phenomena is an atmospheric phenomena and it has also been popularized because these phenomena they act as a popular tourist attraction hence this topic it is important from upsc syllabus because it asks us to be aware in the fields of space now why are we discussing this particular question because before questions have appeared in upsc prelims especially in the year of 2023 with relation to objects in space and their description hence we have curated a practice question on the phenomena of auroras which is also known as northern lights but before discussing let us know more about what is this aurora phenomena now these auroras they are called of natural light display which happens in high latitude regions both in north as well as south pole now in north pole this phenomena it is known as aurora borealis whereas in the south pole it is known as aurora australis now this particularly it happens in north and south pole in the globe because these areas they have a charged ionosphere over above them which helps these ionosphere react with incoming solar flares now we know that sun it emits solar flares and solar winds in different and varying capacity now usually it is in form of solar winds but when the sun activity it intensifies it emits what are known as solar flares now these solar flares when they reach earth they interact with magnetic shield which provides earth with the protection from these very solar flares and the particles which are present in the magnetic field they react with these solar flares producing different colors for example oxygen which is also present in this magnetic shield it provides green as well as red color whereas on the other hand nitrogen it provides blue as well as purple colors now this phenomena that is auroras they are not just prevalent on the planet earth for example any planet which has an atmosphere which is magnetic in nature it provides these kind of phenomena for example it is prevalent in jupiter saturn uranus as well as neptune now after we have discussed what is what are these phenomena auroras let us now discuss the model question now this model question it asks us to consider following statements with reference to auroras the first statement it says that auroras are caused by interaction of charged particles from the sun with earth atmosphere 
Now we know that this statement is correct because charged particles in the Earth's atmosphere, especially the topmost layer, it interacts with solar flares producing these auroras. Further, the second statement, it says that the natural display of light in the sky, it is only visible on Earth, which we know is incorrect because this phenomena, it is also prevalent in Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus as well as Neptune. Hence, which of the statements given above is or are correct? Now, only first statement is correct. Thereby, option A is the right answer. Whereas PYQs are concerned, here also option A was the right answer. Now, with this, let us move to the last prelim-centric article of the day, which appeared in the page 15 of the Indian Express newspaper. Now, this article, it reports that five companies they are planning to launch their IPO, which is an initial public offering in the, in the Indian stock markets. And with this IPO, these five companies, they aim to raise more than 7,000 crores of rupees from the Indian markets. Now, why are these topics of initial public offering important from exam's point of view? And it is because the syllabus of GS Paper 3, it highlights mobilization of resources as an important aspect of Indian economy. And this IPO, it helps private sector companies to mobilize resources from Indian markets. Hence, it is important from UPSC perspective. Further, questions have been asked before with respect to terms in relation to finances. For example, in the year of 2023, a question appeared on the term beta. And in this regard, we have curated a practice question on follow-up public offering. Now, what are these initial and follow-up public offering? Let us discuss this in the next slide. And after discussion, we will come back to this model question. Now, the initial public offering, it is when a company, it brings its shares in the public market for the first time. And by bringing this share, the company, it intends to raise resources from the Indian stock market. And when an IPO, it is offered in the market, it is known as a primary market. Whereas a company which has already floated IPO before, it further wants to raise resources from the Indian market. So what it does is that it brings a follow-on public offering, which the name suggests is a follow-up of this IPO process. And this occurs in the secondary market. In this market, the trades, it happens with existing shares and these FPOs, they are brought in the existing market. Hence, these are known as secondary markets. Now, these FPOs, they are of two types. The first kind, it is known as a dilutive FPO. And in this dilutive type of FPO, what happens is that the company, it introduces additional shares in the Indian market. Now, by introducing the additional shares of the Indian market, the value of existing shares, it naturally reduces. However, it is important to note that the value of companies, it remains the same with this dilutive kind of FPO. Whereas the second kind of FPO, it is known as the non-dilutive FPO. And in this non-dilutive type of FPO, privately held shares, which are usually held by owners or board of directors of the company, it is introduced for public buying. Hence, with this introduction, the value of shares, it does not reduces. Hence, the value and the company's value, it stays the same in the Indian market with this non-dilutive type of FPO, which we have already discussed was not the case in case of dilutive FPO. Because in dilutive FPO, the ex already existing shares, it was added with the new shares, thus reducing the values of ex existing shares. Now, why do the con company, they introduce FPO? Because this FPO process, it is whole lot cheaper than the IPO process. Because the whole regulatory requirement, it is very much less. 
Hence the company, it needs to pay less to the other intermediaries, thereby reducing the cost of these FPOs. Further, as the public, they are already aware of the company's fundamental, their business practices, management, as well as strategy. Hence, this makes investment in these FPOs whole lot safer when you compare with investments in IPO. Hence, after knowing what is this FPO and IPO, let us now discuss the model question, which asks us to consider the following statements with reference to follow-on public offering. The first statement, it says that the follow-on public offering, it is the issuance of share after the company is listed in stock exchange, which we know for the fact is a correct statement. Because the company's shares, it is first introduced through an IPO, whereas in FPO, the shares of the company, they are already existing in the market. Now the second statement, it says that the number of shares, it always increases whenever a company comes up with a follow-on public offering. Now we know for the fact that this number of shares, it only increases in the dilutive type of FPO and not in the case of non-dilutive type. Because in non-dilutive type, the existing shares which was privately held, it is introduced in the market, hence not changing the number of shares that exist. Further, the third statement, Hence, the second statement, it was incorrect. Now, let us move to the third statement, which says that the FPO, it is cheaper and safer option when you compare them with IPOs. Now, this we know is a correct statement. Now, as from the above discussion, we can safely say that only two options are correct, thereby making option B the right answer. Whereas the PYQ is concerned, here option D was the right answer. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, with the conclusion of prelim centric discussion, let us now move to main centric article. And the first article of main centric discussion, it is on the issue of climate change. Now, why are we discussing this particular article? Because in today's The Hindu as well as Indian Express newspaper, you can find three different articles related to issues of climate change. Further, as Conference of Parties 28th meeting, it is scheduled to happen in Dubai during last of November and it will continue till mid of December. And hence, in the entire duration, a student, it will find many articles in both of these newspapers throughout the time. Further, this topic, it is also important from GS Paper 3 perspective. As the syllabus, it highlights environment and biodiversity and climate change, it has a significant impact on environment. Further, the issue of climate change, it also appeared in the mains of the year 2017. As the question, it stated that the climate change is a global phenomena and asked us how to explain the Indias and how it will affect uh, and how India will be affected by the phenomena of climate change. Now, in the scope of today's discussion, I want to simplify the issues that go around and go and have been quite prevalent since the early 90s around the climate change negotiation. Because the phenomenon of climate change, it has increased, it has increased unprecedentedly over the past few years. And we can witness the impact of climate change in form of heat waves, untimely monsoon, storms, floods as well as droughts. As this climate change, it is a global phenomena. Hence, quite naturally, only one nation, it cannot deal with the consequences of climate change. Hence, in order to make our lives more better, all countries in the world, they need to act in unison in order to reduce the negative impacts of climate change. And in this regard, Many countries, or for that matter, all countries around the world, they are involved in climate change negotiation through a platform called UN Forum for Climate Change Convention. 
Now this particular body, it provides for all parties when they meet together and this event, it happens annually and it is termed as a conference of parties and its 28th meeting, it is scheduled to happen in Dubai as I've already highlighted before. But before knowing more about climate change negotiation, let us first understand what is this phenomena of climate change. Now this climate change, it is referred to many phenomena. Primarily, it relates to change in the climate over a long period of time. Now it happens in the Earth's atmospheric cycle. And the issue of climate change, it has primarily brought into attention because this situation, it has increased due to anthropogenic activities. Now what is what are these anthropogenic activities? For example, industrialization, it emits emissions of greenhouse gases in atmosphere. And due to presence of these greenhouse gases, what happens that the temperature of the atmosphere in long term, it increases and it has several negative impact. However, this issue of climate change, it was not seen as a serious problem because of two factors. First of all, this onset of climate change, it has been slow before because the nature of rise in temperature, it has been 1 or 2 degrees over a period of 2 centuries. Or for that matter, 1.05 degree centigrade has increased over the post-industrialization period. Hence, you can see that this phenomena is slow onset in nature. Further, before, there was no established link between anthropogenic activities that are human activities and the, and the phenomena of climate change. And because of slow onset phenomena and absence of link with anthropogenic activity, this climate change, it was not seen as a serious problem. However, what we saw, especially after the end of World War II, that there happened and rapid industrialization and population growth across the entire world. And naturally, due to this industrialization, what happened was that, that there happened to increase in emission of greenhouse gases. And this increase in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, it led to further increase in this climate change phenomena. However, up till the early 70s, Especially until 1972, this climate change was not a prevalent problem. And even in the first environmental summit, which happened in Stockholm, which is located in Switzerland, it led to the formation of United Nations Environment Programme. However, even then, the climate change, it was not a very big problem and it remained in the footnote of the climate conference. However, in the late 1970s, the World Meteorological Organization, it highlighted that emission of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, it has the potential to increase the global warming. However, there were many climate change skeptics and they said that there is no particular link between emission of these carbon dioxide gases and increase in climate change phenomena. However, in the 1998, a very significant development happened and it was the establishment of interpanel climate of climate change. And in this intergovernmental panel, what it did that it provided the world with timely reports. As these timely reports, they are called as assessment reports. And this assessment report what it does is that it provides the world with a definitive link between increase in industrialization as well as rise in climate change. For example, the recent report, it is known as sixth assessment report of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. And it gave a definitive evidence that the climate change and its phenomena, it is on an unprecedented rise. For example, this Sixth assessment report, it highlighted that the global temperatures, it has increased up till 1.05 degree centigrade in the post-industrialization phase. 
And if we do not control the emissions of this carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, this increase in temperature will further increase to 5 to 6 degrees centigrade, which naturally is quite harmful for the entire population of Earth. Hence, this assessment report, it highlights that the world, it should work to limit this rise in temperature to just 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Hence, in order to limit the rise in temperature, we need to naturally reduce the emission of carbon dioxide as well as other prevalent greenhouse gases like methane. Further, the world should work in a specific solution in order to reduce these greenhouse gases. And in this regard, the world should get together to negotiate how much a country should reduce these greenhouse gases. And how was this negotiation achieved? It was through the establishment of U the United Nations Framework for Convention on Climate Change, which formed in the year of 1992. As this particular convention, it was ratified by 197 countries. And this global treaty, it aims to address the issue of climate change through negotiations between parties as the members of this particular treaty, they are known as parties. And they meet annually at a desired place which is known as conference of parties. And in this conference of parties, they negotiate deals which want to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and how should wo the world approach the issue of climate change. Now, there are two significant developments that happened under this United Nations framework for climate change. The first was the signing of Kyoto Protocol in the year of 2005. Now, what this Kyoto Protocol it did was that it imposed obligations on just developed countries. And according to this protocol, these developed countries, they were required to reduce about 5% of their emissions based on the 1990 level of their emissions. However, this protocol, it did not achieve what it intended to. And in this regard, the second important development, it happened. And it was called a Paris Climate Agreement, which was signed in the year of 2015. And in this Paris Climate Agreement, it wanted both developed as well as developing countries to agree to reduce their emissions in order to deal with the menace of climate change. As this particular agreement, it was signed by 194 countries and it imposed these countries with long-term temperature goal as every country in the world, it should look to limit their increase in temperature by 2 degrees centigrade. Further, this agreement, it also wanted countries to aim for further reduction to just 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And, and to limit these temperature, the countries, it should peak by the middle of 21st century. Now, what is this peak? That a country, it should achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions. Now, what is this net zero carbon dioxide emission? For example, a country emits certain amount of carbon dioxide. However, it is able to capture all the amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted. Then the emission of carbon dioxide in a particular year will be zero. Hence, a country, it should aim to achieve this net zero emissions by middle of 21st century. And only when we are able to achieve this emissions to net zero by middle of the 21st century, then we'll be able to limit the increase of climate change to just 1.5 degrees. Now, this particular agreement, it also provides for stock taking of different commitments. And this will happen every five years after the year of 2023. As every member or every party to this Paris climate change, it needed to be summit, 
it needed to submit what are called a nationally determined contributions as a country it will pledge that it will take certain measures to limit the emissions of greenhouse gases and these were given forward in what was called a nationally determined contribution as the country they came up with these contributions themselves and they pledged with this paris climate agreement to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions however the question will appear in your mind whether these two initiatives have been successful or not now these two agreement has faced several issues which we'll discuss them in the next slide now what are the issues that surround climate change negotiations the first it deals with the issue of fairness and equity as we have already discussed in the previous slide the kyoto protocol which was signed in the year 2005 it imposed obligation only on developed countries because developed countries they wanted and according to this kyoto protocol it was developed countries only who should have reduced their emissions by 5% based on the levels of 1990 however this kyoto protocol it did not work in a way it was envisaged because the obligation to reduce the emission it was only imposed on developed countries and these developed countries they were of the opinion that the developing countries especially china and india <coughs> sorry they are also responsible for emission of greenhouse gases hence any climate agreement it should also inculcate these developing countries in order to force them to reduce their greenhouse gas emission and hence in the year of 2015 paris climate agreement was signed and as per this paris climate agreement all the ag parties of con all the parties to this agreement they needed to sign in order to reduce their emissions and naturally this paris climate agreement it imposed obligation not just on developed countries but also on developing countries now developing countries they are of the opinion that historically it is the developed countries that are responsible for emission of most of the greenhouse gases and by benefiting from this emission these developed countries they have achieved a certain high level of economic development whereas on the other hand developing nations they have huge population and in order to support this huge population these developing countries they require a high level of industrialization which is only possible if they emit certain amount of carbon dioxide and hence these developed sorry these developing countries they feel that developed countries should take the loan loan burden of reducing the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions hence according to developed countries this paris climate agreement it went against the principle of fairness and equity because when historically responsible parties especially the developed countries they are not just being made a party to paris climate agreement but these developing countries which have huge developmental obligation they are also forced to undertake the reduction in greenhouse gases hence this paris climate agreement according to developing countries it violates the principle of both fairness and equity because it treats both developing and developed nations on a same pedestal whereas on the other hand the developed nations they have higher levels of technology as well as economic development and they are well placed to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions further the developing nations they agreed to sign this particular paris climate agreement but they asked these developed countries to provide them with finances to support their carbon reduction initiatives and in this regard the finances it was introduced in the unfccc through a constitution of what is known as green climate fund as this green climate fund it was envisaged as a fund which will provide these developing nations with funding to undertake their carbon reduction initiatives and in the year it was created in the year of 2010 
Now, originally, it was envisaged that developed countries will provide $100 billion to this Green Climate Fund. And out of these $100 billion, which will be provided annually, this fund, it will fund the initiatives of developing nations. However, up till the year of 2020, only $10.3 billion have been added to this Green Climate Fund, which we have seen is quite less when you compare with annual commitment of $100 billion. While on the other hand, it is estimated that in order to undertake climate reduction initiatives, these developing countries, they require about $4 trillion of renewable energy financing. While on the other hand, low carbon technologies and its implementation by developing countries, it further requires 5 to $6 trillion. Hence, you can see against an expectation of about $10 trillion, what these developing countries, they got just $10.3 billion up till the year of 2030. Hence, you can see the promises of the finances that was made to these developing nations, it has lagged by a certain and significant amount. Further, you will also ask me whether the targets that are given by these agreements have they become effective or they have they proven to be effective or not? And my answer is that it has not been effective. And why have these targets not been effective in the first place? For example, International Panel on Climate Change, it envisaged that in order to limit the temperature rise by just 1.5 degrees centigrade, the amount of emission reduction, it should be taken by 43% from the 2019 level and it should this reduction it should be achieved by the year of 2030 and this 43% reduction over a 10 year period it means that every year there should be a reduction of 9% of emissions whereas on the other hand as we have already discussed every party to a paris climate agreement they have submitted what is known as a nationally determined contribution and when you add the NDCs of the entire parties of this Paris Climate Agreement, it aims to reduce emissions only about 2% every year. And if we follow these NDCs, the amount of climate change or the temperature increase will not be limited to 1.5 degrees. Rather, as if countries follow this NDC, the amount of increase in temperature will be 2.8 to 3 degrees centigrade, which is double the amount which has been originally intended. Hence, you know <coughs> that the targets which are envisaged by different parties and this Paris Climate Agreement, it has not proven to be effective. Now, let me clear this slide so that I can explain or write more on this slide. But you can take the screenshot of this size of this slide for your future references. Now let us deal with what, I, what is known as adaptation. Now developing countries, they bear the brunt of climate change. And what happens in the climate change? For example, if a developing nation which is on a sea coast, it witnesses gradual sea level rise. Hence you can see the surrounding infrastructure will see incoming water. And hence, in order to prevent this negative impacts, what a coastal country wants to do, that it wants to create walls on the seashore. Further, these countries will also need to undertake various other adaptation in order to make them resilient to the impacts of climate change. And naturally, all these adaptation measures, it requires money. And in this regard, it is assumed that these developing countries in total, they require about $215 billion in order to take these adaptation measures more effectively. However, as against this intended expectation, what adaptation fund was promised to these developing countries? It was in the 
2022 COP in Sharm Al Sheikh. Sorry, in 2021 COP which happened in Glasgow. And in this COP, every developing country it was promised a adaptation fund from a 40 billion dollar fund. And this was increased in two times from a previous 20 billion dollar fund. And these developing countries, they will be provided finances from these 40 billion dollar fund itself. However, as per UN report, this adaptation fund, it has ra rather decreased by 15% and not been provided to these developed or developing countries in an effective manner. Hence, you can see that developing countries, they need finances for adaptation measures which have not been provided to them in an effective manner. And this has created several shortcomings in the climate change negotiations. Further, there is also a phenomena called loss and damage. What is this loss and damage? This loss and damage, it is referred to as irreversible damage which is caused by climate change and its phenomena. For example, there is a natural or a cultural site which is located in a seashore. And due to gradual increase in sea level, which is due to climate change, this building or an infrastructure, it will be gradually submerged inside the ocean. And hence, the not just the infrastructure or economic value, but also the heritage value of this particular infrastructure, it will be destroyed by the climate change. And this destruction, it is irreversible in nature. And in this regard, especially the small island developing states, they are more vulnerable to the impacts of loss and damage. And naturally, they have asked developed countries for funds in order to deal with this loss and damage. As these SIDS, they want to create a separate fund. While on the other hand, these developed nations, they want to create or provide funds in an existing funds. As they feel not morally obligated to support these small island developing states for their loss and damage fund. However, in Sharm Al Sheikh last year, there was signed a agreement which constituted a loss and damage fund. However, the negotiations for this establishment as well as putting money into this particular fund has been ongoing. And yet, this fund is and yet this fund remains empty. Hence, you can see that despite a long-standing negotiation on the issue of loss and damage, the loss and damage fund, it currently remains empty. While on the other hand, these developing nations, they expect $400 billion financing in these loss damage fund, which we have seen from previous example is a difficult task. Further, there are also difficulties in tracking the progress of each and every nation. As we have already discussed, each and every nation, they provide what is known as nationally determined contributions. However, currently there is no single body in U under UNFCCC which will track progress of every nation. Further, every nation in their NDCs, they have given a different timelines as well as different emission targets, which makes tracking progress a more difficult task. Further, there are also formulas for conversion of CO2 emissions to non-CO2 emissions. And every other country, they have a different formula for this conversion, which again makes the tracking progress more difficult in nature. Further, as we have already discussed, especially with relation to loss and damage as well as climate financing, the negotiations are ongoing in nature. Because many different parties, they have a different view how the finances or how the loss and damage should be calculated. And in this regard, there have been disagreements between different parties. And there is a significant provision under the UNFCCC, which is known as Rule 16. As this Rule 16, it allows party to 
postpone this negotiation until the next year and hence when a negotiation between two parties or a group of two parties it reaches dead end then this rule is utilized to push forward the negotiations and hence the difficult aspects such as financing and loss and damages it has not been currently agreed upon and has been delayed further each and every year hence you can see that there has been issues in climate change negotiation particularly with reference to fairness and equity lack of financing opportunities the targets being non effective in nature adaptation difficulties loss and damage agreements tracking progress as well as the ongoing nature of negotiations of climate change and all this development it has led to non effective paris climate agreement and their targets hence in this regard what should be the way forward or what are the other parties of negotiation let us take a very brief look now there are many groups which participate in the negotiations for example there is a group called g77 which is an abbreviation for group of 77 and this group it includes more than 130 developing countries and it also includes india and china now what this group does is that it negotiates with developed countries over the issue of what are the obligations of developed and developing countries and this group it provides and it further agrees to the principles of equity as it feels that it is an obligation of developed countries to provide support and financing to developing nations while on the other hand there is also a, a significant group which is known as alliance of small island nations which is a coalition of 43 low lying island countries and these countries in particular they favor limitation on only increase of 1.5 degree centigrade because if the global temperature it increases beyond this it will provide and it will increase the risk of these countries to the menace of climate change further this also basic group which consists of brazil south africa india as well as china and this group is involved in negotiations with group of 77 over the issue of equity and fairness further there is also a group of least developing nations as these countries they have to bear the brunt of climate change and they do not have the means or the finances to tackle climate change and in this regard india plays a very important role in the climate change negotiations now as we have highlighted that india in particular it is vulnerable to the impact of climate change for example agriculture in a country especially the 55% of gross crop area it is rainfall dependent and if and due to climate change these rainfall events have become scarce and very untimely in nature and this particular example it highlights how much vulnerable is india to the impact of climate change further as we know that india is the largest populous country in the world which makes economic development a very much priority of any indian government hence in order to take economic development india needs a high level of industrialization which brings naturally the associated issue of greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide gas emissions however despite being vulnerable to climate change as well as having developmental imperative india has played a role model like role in the climate change negotiation as you can see from this particular slide that india has given commitment in the glasgow meet of unfccc and in this glasgow meet india submitted what was known as a panchamrit as this was the commitment of reduction in emissions by the indian country for example india wanted to undertake 50% of its reduction in energy requirements and it wants to source its energy requirement from renewable energy itself 
Further, India wants to reduce its carbon intensity by 45%. Whereas in the other NDC, which was submitted in by India five years before in Paris, it only favored about 33 to 35 percent reduction in emission intensity. Hence, you can see India has increased its commitment from 33 to 35 percent till 45 percent. And this highlights that the role India plays in climate change negotiations, which has made India a favorite among many developing nations. As due to this climate change NDC, India has been able to achieve its target to limit the emissions in order to increase just 2 degrees centigrade temperatures. Further, India also involves or engages with Group 77 island nation countries as well as least developing nations and it also negotiates on their behalf with other developed nations. Hence, you can see that India acts as a role model in climate change negotiations. Further, India has also created alternate challenge in order to promote renewable energy as well as reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. For example, India formed international solar alliances. As this alliance, it favors solar power over other carbon intensive power and it will reduce the amount of energy which is emitted by the energy sector itself. Hence, you can see that by playing a role model as well as creating alternative channels for improving the renewable energy, India is playing a key role in climate change negotiation. But what is a way forward in order to improve this climate change negotiation? And the first and the most natural aspect is to increase the collaboration between nations of the North, which are developed nations, as well as nation of the South, which is a term used for developing nations. And when these two parties, they agree together that the menace of climate change, it occurs world over. And it equally impacts both developed as well as developing nations. Hence, when these developed nations, they provide with finances, finances, as well as technology and help these developing nations to deal with menace of climate change will be able to reduce this climate change up till the degree of 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Further, developing nations, they should also make efforts in order to reduce their emissions. As Developing nations like India as well as China, they are responsible for emission of greenhouse gases. And any worldwide attempt to negotiate the reduction in greenhouse gases should also involve these developing nations. Further, what we need to do is to encourage more ambitious targets. As I have already highlighted before, that the targets which are set by NDCs of every country when they combine together it will only lead to an increase of temperature up till 2.8 degrees to 3 degrees centigrade, which we have already highlighted is not enough to deal with the menace of climate change. And hence, when nations, they set ambitious targets, the entire world will be able to limit the rise in temperature to just 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Further, other nations as well as body they should also involved in other alternative treaties. For example, India signed what is known as International Solar Agreement. As this agreement, it favors renewable energy, especially the solar energy, and it aims to reduce the emission that are emitted by the energy sector in general. Further, there was also a treaty signed called Corsia. As this treaty, it wants to reduce emission by the aviation sector. Hence, we can say that a sectoral approach to dealing with climate change, it is also an effective measure in dealing with the reduction of greenhouse gases. Further, what a nation it should intend is to enhance its resilience. And this can be done in two manners. First is by increasing the investment in green climate opportunities. A nation, it can encourage investment in energy efficient sectors. 
Further, nation through budgetary as well as private sector collaboration should also undertake infrastructure development in a more resilient manner. Because climate change, it will negatively impact the existing or new incoming infrastructure. And hence, when a country is in better place through a better constructed infrastructure, it will be able to deal with the menace of climate change in a more better manner. Hence, by increasing the collaboration between North and South, developing nation by increasing the efforts in reduction of climate change, encouraging more ambitious targets by every party to the UNFCCC, signing of alternative treaties like ISA as well as Corsia, as well as enhancing resilience of individual nations will help reduce the menace of climate change and it will also make the climate change negotiations more harmonious. Hence, you are required to understand this topic in order to understand the development which will happen in the next few days and it will also help you develop a perspective over the issue of climate change. As every other aspirant, he should not know about climate change just from a GS paper 3 perspective, but it will also help them develop arguments which will help you in your essay paper. Hence, with this we conclude the climate change negotiation and then we move to this last article of the day which appeared in the op-ed section of the Hindu newspaper. Now the authors of this op-ed, they highlight that the India and Japan relations they are critical in the Southeast Asia because these nations, they should act together in order to implement their Indo-Pacific vision. Now, why are we dealing with Indo-Japanese relation? Because UPSC in GS paper 2, it highlights international relations and India's relation with major countries such as Japan, it is important from UPSC perspective. Further, in the mains of the year 2019, the UPSC, it asked a question on India and Japan and their strong relationship. Hence, we will discuss today the aspects of India's Japan's relation as we also we will deal with challenges that surround India-Japanese relationship. But first, let us discuss what are the pillars of relation between India and Japan. Now, India and Japan in nature and its relation, it is important because India has had a long-standing relationship with Japan. For example, India is involved in a significant bilateral trade with Japan and this, limit, this has reached up till the level of $20.5 billion in the financial year of 21 and 22. Further, Japan, it is the largest official development assistant partner to India. Further, there are four founding pillars of relations between India and Japan. And the first pillar, it is the strategic collaboration that takes place between these two nations. For example, the Indo-Pacific vision, which is already highlighted in this article, it is same of both countries. And both countries, they want a free and open Indo-Pacific. As this free and open Indo-Pacific, it will help countries navigate and utilize this area for their trade and related trades. Further, these two countries, they are also involved in 2 plus 2 ministerial discussions, which is a discussion between defense minister as well as external affairs minister of both countries. Further, they are also involved in defense and security cooperation in the entire Indian Ocean region. For example, Japan and India, they are members of quadrilateral grouping. Further, they are also involved in Malabar military exercise. And these two examples, they show that the collaboration between these two countries are strategic in nation. Further, India has also allowed Japan to undertake development in its critical northeastern states as well as Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Hence, you can say the level of trust that exists between these two countries, it helps them engage in a significant strategic collaboration. Now, let us deal with what are the economic, 
collaboration between these two countries. Now Japan, it is the fifth largest FDI investor in India and it's also the largest official development assistance provider. Further, India has taken significant infrastructure projects with help of Japan. For example, we use Delhi Metro in our day-to-day -day commute. And this Delhi Metro, it was constructed with technology as well as financial support from Japan government. Further, India has also undertaken significant developments in information and communication development with Japan. Further, India's bullet train project, which is scheduled to be inaugurated between Ahmedabad and Mumbai, it will also be undertaken with an active collaboration with Japanese. Further, India has also provided Japan with skilled workers. And it also provide and Japan, it also helps India with skill development of these workers. And you can see that the nature of these two economies, they are complementary in nature. For example, India is rich in human resources as well as has an increased market and large manufacturing setup. And in this regard, Japan, which has high financing, it can support Indian economy in technology as well as investment purposes. And in return, India can provide Japan with a skilled workforce, which is very much necessary in an old age society like Japan. Further, as we have already discussed, India and Japan, they also collaborate in the Indo-Pacific theatre. As we have already discussed above, India is a participant along with Japan in Quad as well as Malabar military exercise. And they also have a common interest in countering Chinese aggression in the South China area. Hence, when countering of Chinese aggression in South China area, both Japan and India's vision of Indo-Pacific, they appear in a convergent manner. Also, India and Japan, in together with India and Japan, in togetherness, they have undertaken infrastructure development in nearby nations such as Bangladesh as well as Sri Lanka. And due to these efforts, these two Indian neighbours, they are provided with a high level of infrastructure development. Further, India-Japan, it also started what was known as Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. And this Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, it appeared as an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. As this Growth Corridor, it provided infrastructural development in African nations which aimed to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is very much colonial in nature. Further, India and Japan, they have also undertaken cooperation on various global issues. For example, India and Japan, they are against weapons of mass destruction. And in this regard, Japan, it has also provided support for India's membership to nuclear suppliers group. And it also agreed to India's agreement on civil nuclear agreement with the United States. Further, India and Japan, they, Japan, it also supports India in its quest for United Nations Securities Council permanent membership. Hence, you can see that India and Japan, they are not just involved in strategic collaboration, but they also have collaboration in economic sphere, in Indo-Pacific region and on global issues like weapons of mass destruction, nuclear proliferation as well as United Nations Security Council. But naturally, there are some instances of concerns in the relation between these two countries. What are these concerns? Let us understand in this particular slide. Now, the first concern, it is related to the untapped economic potential between these two nations. As I have already highlighted, Indian economy and Japanese economy, they are very much complementary in nature. Hence, 
the potential to increase the economic trade between these two countries it is quite significant hence the level of economic potential it remains untapped for examples china it accounts for about more than 20% of japanese trade whereas on the other hand india's imports to japan it only accounts for 8.7.8% of japanese exports as well as 1.7 of its total exports hence you can see comparing with china india's trade with japan it lags severely behind further india and japan it also signed a comprehensive economic agreement called sepa and because of this sepa it wanted the trade between these two nations to get a significant boost but what happened with sepa is that india's trade deficit with japan it increased hence you can see that the signing of this sepa it had a negative impact on india's trade with japan further india's service export which is a significant economic quality of india it faces several hindrances in the japanese economy and this is primarily related to the linguistic barrier further japan it provides with a lengthy visa procedure which also discourages the movement of indian service personnel further india also wants to increase japanese fdi flow however this fdi flow it faces several challenges because of trade facilitation agreements lack of adequate infrastructure in india and issues related to poor logistics and these issues they have not been able to utilize this fdi potential of japan in a more effective manner further india and japan have more common view of various global issues but they have disagreed on over russia and ukraine war for example japan it favored restrictions on russia however if japan it restricts trade with russia it will have a negative implication on indian economy because india it is a significant importer of oil from russia thereby the disagreements due to russia and ukraine war it has a potential to jeopardize the indian japan relationship further there has also been skepticism over the asia africa growth corridor for example india and japan it wanted this asian growth corridor as an answer to chinese bri initiative however significant development in africa has not taken over due to this asian african growth corridor because of bureaucratic and other various reasons hence india in general it is skeptical over promotion and utilizing this opportunity which was provided by asia africa growth corridor and hence in this regard let us look what should be the way forward in order to improve the indo japanese relationship and the first step in this regard is to utilize the sepa in a more effective manner for example stakeholders on both side that is government of japan and government of india it should note that a trade between two nations should be that of equals hence japan it should work on overcoming non tariff barriers and it should also encourage indian products in its domestic markets hence by effectively utilizing sepa by promoting service exports of india to japan it will help reduce the economic difference or the trade deficit that india currently has with japan further india should undertake various developmental measures such as trade facilitation ease of doing business reforms which will help encourage or promote japanese investor to encourage them to invest in indian economy further india and japan it should also rethink in their implementation of asian african growth corridor as india for for example japan it has a lot of investment potential and this cash it should be utilized to provide loans 
to the parties of Asian nations in order for them to create infrastructure in the African region. And only by rethinking the Asia and African growth corridor, then only these two countries will be able to tackle the Chinese Belt Road Initiative in a more effective manner. Hence, by reducing the trade deficit that occurs between India and Japan, by making the Japanese investors invest in Indian economy, as well as rethinking the Asian-African Growth Corridor, then only these two governments will be able to build this relation in a more comprehensive manner. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on India-Japanese relation and it also concludes our discussion of today's Daily News Simplified. However, if a student who has any doubt over this discussion, he can ask me any question in the comment section down below. Now there are two questions. First is from Chandan Singh. He asked that, sir, can you explain the second statement of FPO question? Now let me go to this FPO question. Now the second statement of this question, it says that the number of shares, they always increase whenever a company comes up with a follow on public offer. Now Chandan, as I've discussed in this article, there are two types of FPOs. The first is a dilutive type of FPO and this dilutive type of FPO, it increases the number of shares in the Indian market and existing number of shares, they are also added with the amount of increased shares and naturally this increases the number of shares in the Indian market, thereby reducing the value of individual share. However, despite this exercise, the value of company, it remains the same in the market. Whereas the non-dilutive type of share, it is known as a phenomena where the privately held share of the company, it is introduced in the public. Hence, the total amount of shares in this non-dilutive type of FPO, it remains the same. Thereby, it is not the numbers of shares, it does not always increase but it only increases in the case of dilutive FPO. Hence, this second statement is was incorrect because in the non-dilutive type of FPO, the number of shares, it remains the same. Now, the second question, it says Chandan, uh, it is by Khabri Lala. <laughs> nice name. Uh, Sir, can you please explain to me the Auroras again? Now, as I've highlighted, these auroras, they are a natural light display phenomena, which occurs due to interaction between solar flares and magnetic field of the Earth's atmosphere. And when these solar flares, they meet with magnetic fields, the charged ions in the Earth's magnetic field, it reacts to the solar flares, thus creating different lights. For example, oxygen, it leads to green and red lighting. Whereas nitrogen, which is present in the magnetic field, it leads to blue and purple lighting. And due to this interaction between solar flares and Earth's magnetic field, it creates a phenomena of auroras. Now this phenomena, it is not just rele rele relegated to the Earth itself. Whereas other planets such as Jupiter and Saturn, which has some kind of atmosphere, they also witness this phenomena. Hence, Khabri Lala, your question on Arola, I have, as I expect, I have addressed your question. Now, the third question is by Tamanna, who asks, Sir, can you tell me who are lenders or share buyers in FPO and IPO? Are they same? Now, Tamanna, lenders or buyers of the share in both IPO and FPO, they are the same. For example, you and I, we decide to invest in a share market. Then we can file for getting shares from IPO and FPO as well. Whereas other institutional investors like companies and banks, they also buy shares. So the level of share buyers in both IPO 
and FPO they remain same like us retail buyers as well as other important institutional buyers. With this Tamanna I think I have addressed your question and with this I also think we conclude our today's daily news simplified. Now I will see you again tomorrow at 6 pm precisely. Till then I bid you good night.